distinguished guests, uh, experts in infrastructure uh, from various uh, government organizations, state government, uh, private sector, uh, good morning. On behalf of the uh, Asian Development Bank, I'd like to thank this uh, opportunity to uh, talk about uh, India's infrastructure needs and state's contribution. And this was originally proposed for the next session, but uh, I just uh, stepped in. And uh, I really thank uh, Crystal to uh, invite us. And uh, we also have been, ADB being a, a bank for uh, focusing on infrastructure investments in India. We also closely e e e associated <laughs> with this uh, uh, publication uh, since 2017. And uh, this year, uh, we know that uh, after the post-election budget announcement, uh, Honorable Finance Minister uh, announced that there will be a uh, 100 trillion rupee five-year uh, infrastructure investment plan. So uh, this uh, publication uh, is, is a really op opportune uh, time uh, for this year's uh, edition. Uh, to contribute to uh, India's uh, accelerating infrastructure investments. So uh, from uh, this uh, perspective, we, we just, uh, 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 here's my presentation structure, uh, looking at the infrastructure needs, I think uh, some part, uh, substantial part is already covered uh, in the early session. Uh, and uh, uh, some measures for bridging the financing gap, and thirdly, we see urban infrastructure as a major, major uh, gap uh, for boosting state-level uh, infrastructure uh, investments. So we, we focus on some of the issues we encounter from ADB's operations, uh, urban infrastructure, and uh, lastly, conclusion and, and way forward. And ADB has been uh, actively supporting India, providing annually including uh, finance, uh, the private sector, $4 billion per year, and uh, uh, within which about uh, three quarters are infrastructure uh, sectors. So oh, this is a summary of the infrastructure needs and gaps. And uh, ADB has a publication in 2017 uh, looking at the, examining the uh, Asia-Pacific region's uh, infrastructure uh, requirements. And uh, uh, this publication uh, uh, estimated India's annual infrastructure needs as $230 billion per year for the uh, five-year period from 16 to 20. And if you incorporate the climate change requirement, uh, adaptation uh, mitigation requirements, uh, the amount is $261 billion. And uh, looking at the longer term, uh, from 16 to 30, uh, the figure uh, becomes $290 billion. And with climate change include, uh, included requirement, uh, $343 billion. Primarily, the transport sector uh, is a major, major uh, share. Uh, but this also includes the urban uh, transport. So this is inclusive of all kinds of transport and uh, followed by power, telecommunication, uh, and what are, are, are the key requirements. And uh, uh, on the other hand, this uh, is uh, uh, information we also received fr from uh, Grisil, uh, the actual infrastructure uh, investments in India over the past uh, years. So it's about uh, the last year's estimate is uh, 9.3 trillion rupees, uh, which is about 100, uh, around less than, slightly less than 150 billion uh, dollars. So that means uh, 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 there's still a, a, a huge gap of another, say, uh, 50, 60 percent uh, in, in the light of the ADB's estimate uh, in the recent years. So uh, the composition-wise center uh, is about 30, uh, and uh, state uh, another 30, uh, and, and then private sector uh, is 28 or something. So over the years, as, as highlighted, is the public sector's role uh, due to the uh, a kind of a challenge faced by the private infrastructure investment the share of center and the state is becoming uh, dominant over the past years. 
And uh, this uh, uh, slide compares the, the actual expenditure against the uh, uh, infrastructure uh, uh, needs. And uh, government estimates uh, uh, indicated in 2018 economic survey uh, said $4.5 trillion uh, dollars by 2014. This translates into something like 11 uh, trillion uh, rupees per year, uh, which is uh, probably 160, 170 billion dollars. So uh, uh, then sector-wise, the upper bar shows the requirement as estimated by Chris, I think 2017, 18 report. And uh, the lower bar shows the, the actual expenditure uh, as compared, uh, and also the uh, composition coming from uh, center, uh, state, and the private sector. So this uh, uh, indicates, uh, if we try to draw uh, some implications from this, uh, probably the urban uh, development infrastructure is the uh, sector where uh, there's a uh, biggest uh, uh, gap and also uh, significant state uh, engagement requirement, uh, possibly followed by a, a transport, a road sector, highways, uh, uh, in, in terms of the future needs. Railways probably, uh, I think as, as explained, recent year uh, financial outlay has been substantially increased, and this is uh, primarily center and the private. So probably the conclusion from here is the state will require substantial enhanced investments in urban infrastructure followed by road transport and possibly irrigation, which is not mentioned here. And this table shows, I mean chart shows the last three years capital outlays at the state government level. So as was explained earlier by Chris's presentation, the poorer states like Bihar, Odisha, Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh tends to have a higher capital outlay. And this is probably thanks to higher grant from the center and central sponsored schemes. And also the states like Uttar Pradesh and Assam has shown a huge increase uh, in the over the past two, uh, two years. And uh, uh, so, what, but, what, but on the other hand, the southern states, more developed, advanced states, the percentage is lower, uh, like 3.2% uh, uh, two, uh, two, uh, two, two and, and so. So, uh, but on the other hand, the parenthesis uh, behind the state is the, the annual fiscal deficit. And uh, this clearly shows, as explained, the, the many states are now uh, facing the, the fiscal constraint, uh, excluding, except uh, some uh, more advanced states like Gujarat, uh, Maharashtra are still in the range of less than 2%. And uh, uh, this uh, northeastern states also, it's uh, poor states in general, is uh, essentially having a higher uh, capital uh, outlay than compared with the, the more advanced states, and uh, particularly Manipur, uh, Mizoram. Uh, I think this also reflects the government's recent to act to east uh, policy. And uh, uh, one factor that we also need to take into account uh, in the state uh, capital expenditure is capital outlay of, of budget. So which is not uh, from the uh, on budget uh, uh, capital expenditure. And here we see many particularly advanced states are uh, doing a lot in terms of resource mobilization and capital expenditure. Uh, particularly, I think in case of uh, Madhya Pradesh is exceptional, it's also a poor state. But the Telangana, Karnataka, and uh, uh, sorry, Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. And Telangana is the, in the increasing, whereas the the more disadvantaged states like Assam is uh, uh, much lower in terms of the off-budget capital outlay. But uh, uh, we didn't show the composition of the sector, uh, but the capital outlay of off-budget is substantially uh, uh, from the power sector. So it is a regulated asset, so the revenue stream is clear, 
So there are uh, a lot of pow uh, power sector, uh, you know, off-budget uh, capital expenditure is happening. But the challenge is uh, how the uh, country can also expand this kind of, uh, you know, revenue street based off-budget support investments uh, in the other sectors. So transport is a little bit coming forward, but particularly the urban sector. So that's a, a critical challenge for, for the entire uh, Indian uh, state uh, infrastructure financing. So uh, with this uh, uh, we just uh, would like to look at the, what are the financial gap, and as we show here, uh, the uh, present latest uh, capital expenditure is about uh, slightly less than 10 uh, trillion rupees, whereas the government's new fiscal, uh, uh, I mean, uh, new policy is to increase this to nearly 20, or on the average for the next five years, average 20. So essentially, the infrastructure investment is expected to double in the next five years. So it's a critical challenge in how to mobilize the financing is a big, big question. And so 10 trillion rupees more means about 6% of the GDP. So uh, where the fund come from? Is it from private sector, uh, more fiscal space from the government and so on? It's a big, big issue. And for that, uh, uh, I remember Niti Ayok in the e, 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 India uh, 75 uh, year independence indicated that they may they consider uh, 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 increasing the uh, tax GDP ratio by 5%. But uh, this is a good uh, potential, but uh, again, uh, the, to what extent this can be done, uh, you know, with minimum impacts on the economic growth is one question. But also India uh, requires uh, a lot of more social expenditure, like two, three percent of uh, GDP is probably required for education and health. So in that context, uh, resource mobilization from uh, ordinary tax is uh, augmented by other new types of taxes. And here uh, we listed out several areas uh, like uh, uh, green tax, uh, municipal tax, user fees, and uh, off budget borrowing. And uh, public bonds uh, can also be an area. And uh, of course, borrowing from multilateral, bilateral, and uh, climate finance. And this is an area that is available, but uh, this comes under the on budget. So uh, again, more, more borrowing from the uh, external finance here is, is part of the uh, FRBM limit and uh, also the amount is probably limited at this stage like maximum 10 billion dollars per year so it's a quite a, a still a fraction of the uh, requirement and then the private sector uh, project financing corporate financing needs to be mobilized and a couple of slides I we just would like to highlight is the E, e, one uh, green taxation and uh, uh, this is a new tax that uh, India can mobilize but already 1% uh, of the uh, GDP has been mobilized already in 2014 and uh, other uh, countries are more or less uh, similar scale. So India has been uh, doing quite good on this account and of course there is a, a space for uh, further increase but this also requires a public uh, consultation. And uh, another area uh, that uh, I think uh, probably India may need to focus over the next medium, uh, longer term is the municipal resource mobilization. And uh, uh, here we put down an uh, example of China where uh, municipal uh, or urban uh, development investment company were established and uh, uh, very rapidly mobilized the municipal uh, bonds uh, on behalf of the local government uh, using their land assets as collateral. So uh, it was uh, almost near uh, until 2010, but now reaching 8% of GDP by uh, in 2014. Now, of course, China, uh, the land asset is uh, a public asset, so you cannot uh, just, uh, you know, replicate in India. But on the other hand, uh, when compared with uh, other countries, uh, uh, actually at this moment, India's municipal revenues is just 0.75% uh, uh, of GDP. 
whereas uh, uh, other BRICS, uh, South Africa, Brazil, is 7.8%. And we saw the figure in uh, Italy and uh, UK is 15%. And more developed countries, like, I mean, it is more, uh, I think, uh, countries like North, North Europe, uh, Denmark, and Finland is on the range of 25 or even 30%. So there's a, a huge potential here, and uh, probably India will need to have a, a lot of a policy debate uh, how to mobilize these potential resources. But of course, uh, 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 I mean, uh, towards the next uh, uh, several uh, years. To, you know, uh, Greece mentioned 0.75% uh, uh, in the, over the short time, but I, I think towards 5% over the uh, next decades. And uh, uh, this uh, actually municipal resource mobilization uh, really also can be uh, augmented by land value capture uh, by uh, undertaking some real estate kind of development. And I think in case of Gujarat and Maharashtra, I remember Gujarat's policy, uh, sorry, the law and rule for the urban uh, land pooling is providing a good model for land value capture and utilization. And user charges is also another area that uh, uh, India needs to mobilize. And uh, uh, on that basis, the, the, there are ways like bond, uh, issuing bonds, uh, corporate bonds, uh, and pro promoting, uh, and also equity. But again, this requires, uh, uh, I think, renewable sector, energy sector, it's more developed, but for the urban, like urban areas, uh, it's much more efforts are needed until and unless uh, stable and reliable uh, revenue streams are generated. Uh, it, I mean, it's very difficult to attract private sector uh, investments over there. So, third section is based on ADB's experience, what are the kind of challenges we are facing in the urban uh, infrastructure investments? And uh, we have a, a so far a cumulative commitment of $6 billion, 15% uh, of total commitment since ADB started operation in 1986. An ongoing commitment is $2.6 billion, so 20% of the total uh, ongoing commitment. And we have almost 20 states operation uh, across uh, uh, all India. And uh, in general, urban, uh, I mean, the sector uh, is the uh, most complex uh, infrastructure sector that we face in terms of supporting implementation. Actually, uh, urban sectors, uh, what's called the disbursement ratio is 20%, so annually only 20% of the entire commitment can be implemented. Whereas the, the other sectors like transport and energy, it can reach to 30 plus percentage points. So this is complicated by the uh, challenges of, you know, urban sector is quite complex, and it's not only water sanitation, it's uh, crisscrossed by roads and existing, uh, you know, power lines, and the issues on waste, environmental improvement, housing, and uh, industry. So uh, there's a, a significant constraints, uh, starting from project planning and proposal preparation, implementation capacity and funding availability. So it's not only the, uh, we say infrastructure gap, it's not the funding gap, it's more also the uh, planning capacity gap. There's not sufficient investment proposals in the field. And also implementation is uh, constrained as, as explained in the earlier presentation. So the factors affecting urban investments at the state level need for significant capital to build infrastructure, but advanced states are increasingly limited fiscal space, and the low-income states, also the fiscal space is increasingly limited, but the low capacity. And uh, uh, another significant uh, challenge is lack of ready project proposals. And uh, once the project is drafted, gestation period is longer because of the complexity of uh, multiple agencies involved. And uh, a lower uh, bankability of PPP finance. And uh, as I mentioned, the, the 
ensuing revenue stream from urban investment is still under development, except for some, uh, I mean, ex exceptional cases. Uh, like industrial water use based on uh, water recycling and so on. So this is uh, uh, another challenge. And the complexity in project implementation, uh, management, and weak institutions. So overall, uh, fiscal constraint, uh, nascent bankability for PPPs, insufficient project development implementation. So it's all kinds of uh, challenges are there. And uh, also at the uh, urban local bodies, uh, constitutionally, uh, urban bodies have been provided with the uh, 18 or some uh, functions, but still uh, uh, empowerment is in, in giving authorization and budget is limited. And because of this capacity constraint on implementing uh, complex urban project is also uh, difficult. And uh, uh, so much reliance on grant and uh, uh, again, the revenue stream is still weak, and the uh, uh, PPP ecosystem also is not very well. So, so in that sense, there's a vicious cycle of underinvestments leading to poor service delivery and weak revenue, again leading to underinvestments. So where uh, really do we go from here? And we, I think uh, that there's existing policy framework and strategic directions are all available. So uh, we think that uh, uh, faster implementation of the existing framework, be it the MOUD's uh, urban infrastructure uh, report uh, and municipality reform roadmap of Amrut cities 2015, urban development strategy 2016, and now I think the national urban planning framework is forthcoming. So uh, I think these are all sound framework and uh, uh, important thing is how to translate this into actual actions and implementation. So of our direction, I, I think we, we are, uh, in, in terms of moving towards 0.75% uh, municipal resource mobilization to 5% plus plus, and I think uh, one thing we really need to advocate, and which is also uh, supported by policy documents and advocate is there, and I always understand Mr. Amitabh Kant is always advocating this approach, is try to change the urban planning from the present status quo to more, uh, which is uh, more proactive urbanization. So status quo is uh, uh, urban area is uh, horizontally spreading, and uh, this is causing costly infrastructure, and that transport is based on private vehicles, leading to environmental degradation, and uh, this also leads to lower asset uh, creation and uh, 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 la uh, I mean, uh, pi pi land uh, revenue. So this is a vicious circle is also there. So we need to really stop the process and uh, uh, to make it more uh, uh, pursuing a proactive urbanization with strategic planning and uh, along the transport corridors and industrial clusters and make sure that the urban development is vertically taking place uh, rather than uh, 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 horizontally spreading. So uh, this can really uh, facilitate or enable efficient infrastructure services uh, because uh, uh, infrastructure can be concentrated and the public transport is also more efficient and clean environment and uh, this can really uh, 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 create higher asset value uh, per unit of land and uh, uh, revenue generation, municipal resource mobilization, uh, leading to further investments and, and uh, attracting private investments. So some uh, change of the planning and implementation approach also needs to start to take place. Uh, so uh, with this, uh, uh, the specific measures for addressing urban infrastructure gaps, so at the planning and implementation uh, side and uh, uh, resource mobilization side, on the planning and implementation, uh, more on integrated long-term urban development planning at the state and uh, municipality levels, and the developing uh, shelf of uh, uh, project proposals. As I said, uh, the present uh, uh, amount of available DPRs uh, are quite limited uh, against the actual needs of the urban infrastructure investments. And empowering ULBs and creating SPVs and building capacities, project planning and implementation. 
and uh, uh, engaging the right people, or decision making, exposure to best practices. And on the resource mobilization side, I think uh, uh, now that smart cities, Amrut, is now really is starting to, uh, uh, I mean, uh, accelerate it. So uh, tapping, uh, leveraging with uh, central grant. But at the same time, I think uh, there's also a need to augment the state transfers to, uh, uh, in a commensurate manner with ULB's empowerment. And then uh, local resource mobilization through, as I said, land-based revenue, uh, through reforms in land use, building regulation, and property, other tax systems, and try to uh, uh, create more value from unit of land by advocating more uh, uh, vertical development. And the municipal bond, uh, and, once, uh, and once revenue is generated, that can be securitized uh, to issue municipal bonds or borrow from uh, external markets and, and public uh, banks. And then uh, building, uh, strengthening financial intermediary based uh, funding with enabling PPP ecosystems. And I think uh, states like Tamil Nadu is moving towards this direction and strengthening OM financing with reforms in tariffs and other service uh, charges. And uh, then the question is how to uh, you know, uh, undertake these kind of requirements in on-the-ground level actions. And, and ADB has been uh, advocating recently more uh, sort of a, uh, uh, as a new approach, uh, catalyzing investments with strategic planning. So looking at the lack of investment proposals and also great potential for industrial development, uh, we have started to work with the East Coast states uh, to undertake a, a industrial corridor of planning at the regional level, state level, and also more uh, micro-industrial cluster levels. So this has, been, this has uh, started with an objective of facilitating the states to undertake a macro level planning. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, then uh, uh, undertake the more industrial cl cluster oriented uh, development uh, planning based on which a shelf of project is prepared and uh, uh, financed. It's not only through ADB, but also central funding, other external fun financiers and so on. So, uh, so far, uh, the, uh, the industrial corridor planning at the state level was undertaken in all the four states in, in the uh, East Coast, Tamil Nadu, uh, Andhra Pradesh, uh, Odisha, and West, West Bengal. And now we're extending it to uh, northeastern regions through another corridor in the Bangladesh, southwest, and northeast. So this is an approach that we have been uh, advocating, and this is also try to uh, catalyze uh, public and private uh, investments. So the uh, components of the corridor investment planning is, is, is essentially four, uh, the output. So there's an uh, industrial cluster where no land is identified in, in, at the state's level, uh, probably four to five clusters are identified in each state. And then uh, this is uh, 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 industrial node uh, cluster. Each industrial node cluster uh, is taken up for detailed land use planning. And uh, uh, this is also uh, supported by a trunk level uh, network infrastructure. So railways, logistics, uh, highways, uh, uh, and so on. And then the standalone projects like ports and airports. So it's a uh, idea is to develop a comprehensive industrial development plan uh, from the uh, network uh, infrastructure, uh, industrial nodes infrastructure, and also the standalone essential facilities. And the uh, sample is the uh, Andhra Pradesh uh, state level corridor planning has been done. So this uh, shows the example of uh, a transport network, rail grid, and uh, port uh, facilities that uh, investment uh, scope has been identified. A total scope of 38 billion uh, of infrastructure uh, pipeline has been developed uh, for all uh, kinds of investors. Uh, and uh, uh, industrial nodes land is 14%, uh, nodes infrastructure, cluster infrastructure, inside infrastructure, internal infrastructure is 34%. 
and spine and, and uh, uh, infrastructure. It's a network infrastructure connecting the uh, in, uh, industrial uh, cluster is 42% and standalone uh, 10%. And this also includes the cluster area detail land use planning. And uh, uh, so area is divided into startup areas and then phase two, phase three, phase four. And uh, uh, in each areas, detail land use planning has been undertaken. And uh, uh, overall framework also envisaged resource mobilization planning and uh, uh, short term uh, various types of infrastructure. Uh, I think we need to start with substantially public sector financing uh, because uh, initial land and internal infrastructure needs to be developed first before the uh, investors can come. But over the medium term, uh, cluster expansion, further network expansion and so on, uh, is uh, envisaged to be undertaken by more uh, private sector, uh, private capital, uh, I mean, uh, mobilization. So th this is a sample that uh, there's a scope for a similar, uh, uh, the e e state level planning and uh, detailed land use planning and try to do a, a medium term uh, resource mobilization and uh, move from the uh, public sector dominated investments to a more uh, private sector uh, dominated investments. So this is something we are trying to uh, work with uh, at this moment, uh, Tamil, uh, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu in particular, and followed by Odisha and West Bengal. So conclusion, way forward, uh, I would uh, like to highlight a few points. So uh, this presently, in. Uh, 100 trillion five-year investment plan for addressing uh, infrastructure bottlenecks. It's providing a great opportunity for all of us here uh, to uh, help support uh, implement. And this is really moving towards addressing India's infrastructure bottlenecks. Uh, but uh, we need to take uh, note that the large gaps uh, exist in terms of ready investment proposals, uh, implementation capacities, and funding availability at the state level particularly urban infrastructure and followed by transport. And for accelerating infrastructure investments, uh, boosting uh, investment proposed, uh, project proposals uh, is extremely important for which state corridor urban planning, uh, DPR preparation uh, needs to be undertaken. And for that, uh, uh, I think the state government of Tamil Nadu has established a project development funding mechanism. So such kind of uh, advanced to uh, uh, efforts to advance the upstream uh, planning so that uh, the country has a, a shelf of uh, investable project proposals are, are coming forward. And addressing capacity constraints of states and ULBs, uh, it's re with respect to pre-construction, construction, sustainable service delivery. And uh, for mobilizing private and other capital, uh, I would like to highlight the boosting revenue streams uh, that can be securitized uh, is, is extremely important uh, for future uh, private capital uh, mobilization. And uh, uh, we also think that the strengthening uh, national state financial intermediaries also uh, is an important subject and revitalizing PPP investments. As far as urban infrastructure is concerned, probably the, uh, uh, it depends on the uh, level of development, but probably more investment light contract structure of PPP and higher uh, VGF is uh, probably more uh, important. And also a lot of uh, multilateral development partners like ADB for bringing funding gaps while facilitating the, the above. And lastly, uh, this is a summary of what ADB is doing in terms of uh, facilitating uh, all these uh, uh, new types of uh, engagements, uh, attracting more uh, private capital. And uh, we have a uh, uh, infrastructure uh, credit lines for PPP, uh, particularly working with IIFCL. So uh, totally almost 1.7 billion uh, project is ongoing. And uh, we also see uh, good progress in terms of hybrid annuity. Uh, so Rajasthan, uh, Karnataka, uh, Madhya Pradesh, this, this model is being implemented uh, with a total investment of almost $1.4 billion. 
And the strategic planning, as I mentioned, east coast, to coast, northeast, and also Uttar Pradesh, we have been undertaking to facilitate uh, you know, statewide uh, investment planning for uh, industrial uh, development. And the urban uh, resource mobilization, Tamil Nadu uh, urban projects, we are uh, trying to leverage uh, smart cities and Amrut and also state financial intermediaries uh, to really help them um, uh, mobilize private capital. And uh, uh, at the state level operations, uh, institutional reforms for enhancing property tax collection is one important agenda we have been uh, pursuing. And 24 by 7, uh, with the uh, private operators and uh, uh, operational uh, cost recovery. And uh, there's also uh, new types of uh, credit enhancement mechanisms, and we are working with the, the IIFCL on this account, and the uh, uh, Climate Investment Fund is another area that we have been working. So overall, uh, thank you very much for these opportunities, and uh, uh, ADB is keen to work with the state governments as well as all the private investors to address all these uh, India's uh, uh, critical investment challenges. Thank you very much.